Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as we always do, we want to greet you, Alice, Mark, and myself, in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are blessed that you can join us for this time in God's Word. And this time in God's Word, we're continuing on in the study that we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, and the second letter to Timothy, Paul's second letter to Timothy. Um, we'll be picking up where we left off last week in the first chapter in verse 8 is where we're going to start. And start we will right after Brother Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together. Well, Lord, we are thankful it says in your word that wherever two or three of us are gathered in your name, in your name, you're there also. And uh, just guide us and pull out from your word what we need to learn. Amen. Amen. All right. As I said, we're going to start at 2 Timothy 1 8. All right. Ready? All right. Ready. Mm -hmm. Here we go. On the market, set, set go. go. <laughs> Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be a partaker of the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, remember when we talked about when we started this, that this letter from Paul to Timothy is being written from prison in Rome. Right. Okay. Yes. So don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The testimony of our Lord. Well, Paul had written in his first letter to Timothy, in, in 1 Timothy 6, and I'm going to start reading at verse 12. Mm -hmm. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. You want to know what the testimony is, of Jesus is? You know what it was his confession? Yes. It was not the testimony of Jesus is not that he was killed by the Romans mm -hmm. as a common criminal which is basically what, what he happens. was, right? What happens, yes. But the confession is, and the testimony is, that he trusted in the love of the Father and confessed before Pilate mm -hmm. that God, his Father, was in control. Amen. That's right. That's the good confession, and that's the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of Jesus Christ includes the fact that he said to the Father, not my will, but thy will be done. I pray that that becomes a confession of us all. Yeah, that should be our testimony. And when you know that God the Father is in control, mm -hmm. well, then you can surrender your will. Yes. Okay? Not my will, but thy will be done. He prayed that in the gar garden, and, and so he was crucified, died, and was buried, but death could not hold him. Mm -mm. And then it's written in Philippians 2. From verse 9 to 11, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Every knee. The Jews who were there that day who called for his crucifixion. Pilate who found him innocent and then condemned him to that death. The soldiers who mocked him and then nailed him to the cross. Caesar who sat back in Rome on his throne. All of them will bow their knees and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee shall bow. It doesn't matter what it looks like now. It says in, it says the end of the matter is better than its beginning. This is what's going to happen at the end, right? That's the testimony. It doesn't matter what it looks like at the moment. And Paul knew that. That's why he said, don't be ashamed of me, nor me, his, his prisoner. Right? Because he was in prison when he wrote this. Paul was never ashamed of his chains. Never. Because he never saw it the approval of men. Mm -hmm. And as he would instruct Timothy here in this letter, later on in 2 Timothy chapter 2, which we'll get to, he said, be diligent, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman 
who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. You don't need to be ashamed when you are walking in faith, led by the Spirit of God, and confessing the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You'll never need to be ashamed. Doesn't mean you won't be attacked. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you won't be per 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 persecuted, is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what. You will walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. You see, that's why he goes on in here and he writes to Timothy that he should be a partaker of the sufferings for the gospel. A partaker of the sufferings. Right. Now, in these days of ear-tickling messages mm -hmm. that preach ease and abundance and comfort, you're not likely to hear that message very often preached. What message? This message. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. How, when was the last time you heard somebody stand behind a pulpit and preach that the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance? It's the word of God. Yes, it's sir. 2 Corinthians 1.5. It's nothing to fear. It is nothing to fear, because if God is for you, who can be against you? And, you know, this should not come as any surprise. That's not a message that's going to build megachurches. But it is not a message that should surprise any bondservant of Christ, any Bible-believing Christian. Because Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. John 15, 18. You know the world's going to hate you. And if that's not specific enough... Then in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, and you will be hated by all because of my name. That's one of the wonderful promises of God. You want the promises of God? That's one of them, right? And then here in this second letter, Paul will say to Timothy, a couple of chapters along here, however long it will take us to get there. But in chapter three, Paul says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. That's a promise of God. He watches over his word to perform. Why? Because he knows what's happening and he knows what's coming. Last week we talked about, because it, here in Timothy, he said, you know, God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, right? So we talked about the timid. It is the timid, the cowardly among the saints who will compromise. And when Christians compromise with the world, they're turning their white robes of righteousness into white flags of surrender. Do not give up. Do not give in. Do not surrender. Because victory is on the way. Hallelujah. When This is a, a big thing. You know, I mean... We, we talked about this last week when we talked about timidity and fear and power and boldness, right? Mm -hmm. when, when God spoke to Joshua, as he was get, jo turning, taking Joshua to lead the people of God into the promised land, right? In the first chapter of Joshua, he's, God said to him, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If that's the reality of your life, I want to tell you something. You will walk with such confidence. You'll be radiating the confidence of the Lord. You'll walk always in the triumph of Christ. And you will Christ. walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. If you, but, you know, let's just say that again, because I'm telling you. You have to If it. you live the gospel mm -hmm. and share the gospel, you will suffer for the gospel. Right. That's a fact. And you will walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Why? Because the world hates us. It's only when, you know, the three of us have lived, we've lived, we've been some places. <laughs> but we lived for a while in Central America. We lived in Belize. We lived out in the bush. And, you know, I, I, I've shared this. Alice and I are originally from New York City, you know, and you don't see a lot of snakes in New York City. That's a fact. Right. Thank God. <laughs> You don't see a lot of snakes in New York. No, well, I, you can up in the mountains, yeah. Kind of. Yeah, they, they them, do. But, okay. 
Well, it's not cold in the summer, brother. Yeah, they do have some. And they hibernate. Yeah. So that, no, let's not get off track on okay? The, the, the thing is, what well, I didn't know much about snakes, but when we went to Central America, where there are an abundance of snakes, some very deadly snakes, one of the things that I learned was that, by and large, snakes will leave you alone, mm -hmm. as long as you leave them alone. Mm -hmm. You're too big. I mean, look at you. You know, a snake that big, he may have the power of venom to kill you. But the fact is, he's not going to do that unless he feels threatened because you're too big for him to eat. And I mean, that's why they've been given the venom and that's why they hunt is to feed. Mm -hmm. But if they feel threatened, they'll use it as a weapon. Right. So if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. And that's like this. If you Christians, if you leave the world alone, they'll probably leave you alone. But Jesus gave us authority to tread on serpents. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're supposed to be doing on that old devil. We have authority over him, and we're supposed to be stepping on him. But when you step on him, don't be shocked that he strikes. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. That's exactly what Peter wrote. Absolutely. Okay. So let's let's move on. I'm gonna I'm gonna do better than I've been doing. <laughs> Verse nine, Second Timothy one nine, talking about our God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. All right? We have been called with a holy calling. He saved us and called us with a holy calling. You and I, us believers, have been set apart by the Lord. Which For is, his own purpose. That's, what, and it, that's what, what's his purpose. Well, let me start by just saying this. Because Peter wrote... But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 2 9. His purpose, he called us out of the darkness and into the light that we might proclaim his excellencies. One brother, now going on that I really look forward to meeting. I really like to have a sit down and just have a chat with him for a little bit. It was Lazarus. <laughs> yeah. Because he certainly attests to this truth with his life. Mm -hmm. uh, better yet, with his life and his death. Yes. Or his death and his life. Okay. Jesus stood outside of Lazarus's tomb where he had been buried four days dead now. And he commanded that the stone that blocked the tomb be rolled away. Right? Mm -hmm. And when he did, it says, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, and come forth. The man who had died, this is what it says, the man who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, the people around, unbind him and let him go. That's John 11, 43 and 44. You see, like Lazarus, like him, we were all called by name. Yes. You're, you are saved because the Lord called you by name. Mm -hmm. he, he raised you from the dead, and then like Lazarus, he required you to change from the garments of death, and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is a holy calling. And the garments of praise. And garments of praise. Amen. I mean, there's, there's actually a lot. I did a Bible bite one time about what a wardrobe should look like for, for believers. I mean, That's right. yeah. it's um, pretty interesting. So it's a holy calling, not according to works. Now, that may sound so simple to you, mm -hmm. but the fact is it's so hard for most people to get it in reality, in practice. Your salvation, your relationship with God is not based on your works. Okay? No. no. Salvation, by the way, is not free. Yeah. That, you know, some people get confused about that. Well, yes, salvation is the free gift of God, but like any gift, somebody went out and bought it to give. Mm -hmm. Our salvation is the most precious, the most costly thing 
that the world has ever seen, right? The price was Jesus, and the price was paid in full. I want you to hear those words. The price was paid in full. Paul wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 2, 13 and 14, and he said, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions and canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The debt, because the wages of sin is death. We owed God life. But he sent Jesus in our place. And the debt was paid, and that certificate of debt was nailed to the cross, paid in full. All right? You, I'm, I, I feel I feel pretty certain that you know this, but doesn't going to no, isn't going to stop me from it saying it. Hurt to hear it again. Salvation based on works is a false gospel. Yes, it's a false gospel. I mean, that's important that you understand that it's a gospel, mm -hmm. but it's a false gospel. It's a lie from the pits of hell. No, let me say this: it is the lie from the pits of hell. The very first attack from the enemy, from the adversary, on the people of God, what took place in the garden, when that lying serpent said to the woman, has God said? Mm -hmm. The first thing he did was to call the word of God into question. Mm -hmm. And then telling her that she could make herself like God. That, 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 listen, that's the first sermon that's preached in the Bible. And it's, I mean, you know, by somebody other than God. Yes. And it's a false gospel. She could, Satan told her that she could make herself like God by disobeying God when it came to eating the fruit on the tree, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She could do something to make herself like God. That's a different gospel. It's a different gospel. Yes, it is. Consider the strong words of Paul. These are strong, strong words of Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit, and written to the Church of the Galatians. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I'm going to tell you something. We are called to test all things and hold fast that which is good. We are called to test the prophets because many false prophets have gone abroad. You need to be checking when you listen to a sermon, when you listen to this teaching, when you listen to any teaching, any sermon. Test it. You need to test it against the word of God. And you know what that requires? It means you don't go out, okay, we're going to leave here and go out and have lunch at Red Lobster. It means that you spend time with the Lord after, after this Bible study, after a sermon, and you spend time in conversation with the Lord. Because that's the only way all of this is going to become burned into your heart, become the reality of your heart, become the reality of your life. Test it, okay? Because, you know, we spoke a lot last week about faith that is not sincere. Right, insincere faith. Insincere faith. Mm -hmm. Insincere faith can just become our works in disguise. Mm. Disguised is faith. Yes, yes. Okay. You know, years ago, I, I'm going to say back probably in 1978, somewhere around there, I did a series of teachings. I was preaching for like a week. At a, at a hall in a, a suburb of New York City. And while I was doing that, the Lord spoke to me and gave me something that I hadn't seen before. But it, it deals with the Red Sea. You see, at the Red Sea, when the Lord was taking his people out of the bondage of Egypt, they mumbled and gum, gum, grumbled and complained until they saw the waters parting. Right? Right. Now, I want you to note that the scripture says this. Psalm 106, verse 7 and 8. 
Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses, but rebelled by the mm-hmm. sea, at the Red Sea. You know, I, a lot of people, I mean, we celebrate the Red Sea, but God says that was rebellion. Yes. Because they would not act by faith. They didn't act by what he had spoken. They had to see it, which is why Moses wound up staying, finally, stand by and see the salvation of God. And when the waters were parted, then they walked. But they didn't have, they did not have the faith to step out expecting the waters to part. So my question. I was just thinking about that and the fact that when God tells you to do something and you don't do it. It's rebellion. It's rebellion. But there may be a time where you can't repent of it. It may be too late. Well, that's always a danger. Okay. Which is why. This is, it's never to be treated lightly right. to hear the voice of God and not do what he says. Exactly. Never, ever to be treated lightly. There, you know, the best story that I've heard you tell was the story of the, IB, the guy that worked for IBM and was six months away from being vested. And he walked away from it. Right. Because God told him. Oh, God he told him. He was faithful. And he obeyed. And he obeyed. And he saved a life and got a ministry. That was the result of it, yes. He yes. came out of it, yes. But I, I just want to throw on this because, you know, Alice and I have had the opportunity. We've traveled a great deal of the world anyhow and visited with and spent time with churches of lots and lots and lots of different denominations. This should only be one. Mm. But I said, one of the things that I saw, and and this was what God spoke to me back then in the 1970s, was if we were, as the people of God, the the people of God today were at a Red Sea event, Mm -hmm. all right? The promise of God is there, but it seems that there's an impassable, impossible barrier between you and the the promise promise of God. That requires you to step out in faith. But they didn't. Yeah. But today, I believe that the Christians would basically fall into one or two camps. Right. And the most dangerous is works. How could they solve that with works? Well, look at what goes on in the church today. I believe that they would put, call and put a committee together and start raising funds and say, let's build a bridge. That's right. And they would look for the bridge building blessings because they would try and make their own way across that Red Sea. And even if they did, you know what? The chariots would have been right behind them. And it never would have saved them because it wasn't God's plan. So if you're doing it with your own works, that's bridge building blessings. But there's another side, and this is insincere faith. This is ferry boat faith. Right. Because those more spiritual Christians would get down on their face and they'd start confessing a ferry boat. Ferry boat is coming. Ferry ah, ferry, boat is coming. Oh God, we're believing for a ferry boat. We're believing for a ferry boat. And even if a ferry boat came, you know what? The chariots would have followed right back onto it. But the fact of the matter is, that's not faith. Yeah. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you are doing something and it's not what you heard from God, it is, it, it's, oh, okay, it's faith. It's insincere faith. Right. It is a deceitful faith. It is a lying faith. So leaning on your own understanding. Leaning on your own understanding faith. So it doesn't matter whether you try and build a bridge with your own hands or you start confessing a ferry boat that God didn't speak to you about. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, if you want victory in your life, you better just hear and obey the word of God. Amen. Okay. He saved us according to his own purpose and grace, it says. Right. What is his purpose? Why did he heal the man who was born blind in John chapter 9? So he well, be. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so God could be glorified. Jesus answered when the apostles were saying, why is this man been born blind? Jesus said, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so the works of God might be displayed in him. John 9, 3. The reason for this whole thing was that the works of God would be displayed. When Lazarus, just talked about Lazarus, when Lazarus was sick unto death, why did Jesus purposely wait before going to Bethany until his dear friend had died and was buried? I'm glad you asked. John 11, 4 says this. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God 
so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. It is the first and foremost thing it is about praise and glory for God. That's the, all the trials, all the tribulations are so people can see God at work in our lives. Mm -hmm. Even if it looks like defeat to, in, in the natural, right. yeah. the peace that you have, the love that you have, even for your enemies who are doing it, the joy that you will still have, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, are it's the awesome. great testimony to the unsaved, mm -hmm. right? The lack of fear. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah a long time ago, and he said, the people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. That's the purpose. What's the purpose? We just talked about it. Your chosen generation, your royal priesthood, oh. called by God to come out forth darkness. out of darkness and, marvelous light. and proclaim his excellency. That's purpose in our lives, is to proclaim the excellencies of God. It's about the Father preparing a bride for his son, a bride without spot or wrinkle. You want to know? It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all his glory, all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, mm. but that she would be holy and blameless. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. This is God the Father preparing the bride. What's our purpose? To be the bride of Christ. We're to be sanctified. Back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, he wrote, In this you greatly rejoice, now, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when things go wrong in your life, you know what you need to do? Say, what's in this for you, Lord? Amen. Yes. Lord, let this, be a, let this be a testimony of your glory. Be let this be a reason that people will praise you when they see you at work in my life. Amen. And it says that this was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? From before the foundation of the world. It says in Luke 10, 19 and 20, this is Jesus. And I mentioned this before. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. The Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Okay, we've uh, just run out of time. Again. Again. <laughs> I, you can do that. But you know what? Please, like I said, ponder these things. Think on these things. Spend time talking with the Lord. Mm. Talk with brothers and sisters about it. Make this, make this a part of you. Yes. Not what I'm teaching, the Word of God. Right. Make the Word of God active and living in your life, which it's supposed to be, for the glory of God. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you can use our lives, that you can use our lives to show your works. You can use our lives to bring praise to yourself, Lord God, to show forth your glory. Let us be willing, Lord God, to walk wherever you call us to go, trusting in your salvation, trusting that you are the God of the impossible, that there is no barrier between what you and what you've told us you desire that can stop us from accomplishing your purpose. We praise you, we bless your holy name, we glorify you, and we worship you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Thank you. Of your mighty love.